trusty. So yeah, I just, I record these, I throw them in a cloud and it's like every deal I bought, every small like property I bought, um, we're getting into this like businesses. Like I have it all in this, I have it in the cloud. So my kids are like, dude, dad's gone. Inherited all this shit. Like, what do I do with it? And they go in there and like, see exactly what I was thinking when I bought it. Here was the game plan, and then they could continue that business on their own. So kind of weird, kind of morbid, but yeah, it's gotta be done. like when you look at, like think about Amazon. Like what if Jeff Bezos went and created, like if you could see day one of Jeff Bezos in the garage going, here's what I'm thinking, here's why I'm thinking it, and here's how I built it. Wouldn't that be freaking awesome to look at? Like Elon Musk, like here's why I bought Tesla. Here's what I was originally thinking. Like that would be really cool. Yeah. So I'm not just recording for that. I love it. So my kids have it. So this is literally how I go through things. This is just in public. So this is what I was going to do in my office. So the problem I'm trying to solve is, it's not really a problem, but here's, here's what we did. So two years ago, we went and bought a house for 100,000. And then we bought a bunch of houses between 20,000 20,000, 20,000, 30,000, 20, 40, 60, 70, 80, 90. Oh, yes. All right, cool. So this gives us, this one was 30,000. So this was a package of properties that we bought for 200,000. With other people's money. So we went borrowing, I believe, hard money on this deal. We went to the bank three months later and they gave us $300,000. We paid off the hard money and then we had $100,000 in money extra. They wrote us a check. So they gave us $100,000 to go out and buy cash flowing assets. And we did that. So then we went and bought, you know, some houses over here, 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 and here and one over here. So these all cash flow. Today, these houses are all kind of sold. This has new line of credit on it. And this one's being sold tomorrow for $200,000. And in here we were able to, we sold this one for like 80, 75, 70, I think 69. So there's 160, 55, 115. There's, there's roughly pay off the note. There's about $150,000 in capital gains here. And this is just a, kind of a small portfolio. Deal. So $150,000 in capital gains in a 40% tax bracket. Because I believe this is going to be on, on short term, so that's going to give me a sixty thousand dollar tax liability if I were to do nothing. So I'm trying to solve my problem, which is a sixty thousand dollar tax liability. And what do you do with the cash? So you can do a couple things. You can do what's called 1031 exchange, and you can take the hundred and fifty. And your investors, like Logan, you're dealing with investors. You might hear that word floating around. Um, 1031 exchange, they could take the $150,000 and go park it in, you have to identify, okay, you're going to buy the car dealership, Logan, mm -hmm. and he says, hey, I'm using this as 1031 exchange. You need to put on the purchase agreement, these funds are from a 1031 exchange. Uh, and then the funds can come from the 150. You can add to it, but then this $150,000 becomes a deferred tax. You do not pay the tax this year. It goes into your next property, venture, whatever in which you set up a 1031 exchange. This has to be done through a 1031 exchange company and the funds have to be earmarked. You can never touch this money. It has to be done through a qualified intermediary or a QI is what they call these people. So that's one way you can avoid paying the capital gains right away and you can essentially roll it into the next property. So you can take the 150, you can go ahead and park it here and use the down payment by a $500,000 property cash flow it, flip it, do whatever, but you're not going to pay tax on this until you sell this. Or if you choose to exchange this property again, 
and you just keep rolling your capital gains. Ideally, you want to roll your capital gains until you die. Because then the estate, no estate tax, it just falls off. And you don't pay the capital gains ever. So the goal, instead of doing that, you roll it into this 500000 And say you want to use that money, but you don't want to pay taxes. Then you go to the bank. You say, hey, bank, I don't want an equity line on 150 And now you go take the 150 and you go ahead, say you bought this cash, you had extra cash, brought over a couple of these, you pulled $150,000 as a loan. Now you go use that 150 and you never pay, you're not paying tax on it. You're getting access to it through the bank and via a loan in another property. That's one way of doing it. Or I'm not doing a 1031 exchange because I'm not super excited about a whole ton of opportunities. Um, I actually have a lot of these different ones I need to do, but here's what I'm kind of looking at. So, I feel the economy's going in this weird direction. And you guys kind of heard about the great retirement where all, you have all these baby boomers retiring from their businesses. I'm looking at buying some different companies. All in the home services, things that we're already doing, right? We're, we sell houses. Exactly. Yeah, that kind of stuff. I already talked to Jeff and Terry about that. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever find an HVAC company? You know, to buy? You were looking for? Well, yes. I'm in the middle of buying three. That's actually what I'm doing. I'm, I'm working on working through these deals. So we're in the middle of due diligence right now. Uh, I can't say where or what they are or any of that because I've signed 900 non-disclosures and it's a gazillion different things, but we certainly go over the details of what we're looking at. So company one is in the residential HVAC company, HVAC space. So this company currently does $390,000 in revenue. Their EBITDA for earnings before interest, tax, and amortization, we'll call it NOI to make things simple, or cash flow. What they construe to be profits are 128,000. There's not a whole lot of writing that they need to do here. I'm just literally brain dump. Uh, $128,000 in net operating income. There are currently five employees, five full time employees. They have, I think, four trucks. Take that back. They have three trucks, no building. They're working out of their house. Um, and three of the guys, there's one main owner and there's three other minority owners in this company. Three owners currently. So what they're doing is they're building, they built this company at 390,000. It's a five-year-old company. They're growing so fast, they have no idea what to do. It's like three HVAC dudes who are like, hey, we're really great at doing HVAC, we went out and did HVAC, and now what? We, we're working out of our house, we got our trucks, we're too damn busy. I don't even know who's answering the phone. I think one of the wives are answering the phone. I don't know what they're using for lead routing. I don't know. But I understand they have 63 reviews, and they're all freaking amazing. Like this dude, Bradford, is like the man. I've never seen reviews like this guy gets. So these guys want to stay in. These guys want to manage the company. One guy wants to be the primary owner, and we're going to have... The two minorities want to stay a 10% owner, a 10% owner, and they want to give up 60% of the company. So they want to give up 60% to me. Full and Bradford. It's going to keep 20. This guy wants to run day-to-day -day operations. Okay, they just need money. So... For this, they are asking $175,000 purchase price for 60% share in the company. So 175, so they're valuing the company at, what does that come out to be? About 350, about $400,000, a little bit less than that. About $380,000 is what they're valuing this comp these cash flows. So what they're doing is they're essentially assigning a three times multiple to this. So 128 times three gives you about what they're thinking for the actual value of the entire company. Um, if they're going to sell me 
60% for 175,000. So it's about three times multiple. Where'd they get the multiple? Um, they all kind of have their own idea of what multiple should be at various stages. So an HVAC company typically runs between four and six. Uh, if it has stuff, this one is more of a, and this isn't the price we'll pay. It, our price will be less than this because inside these numbers is these guys doing a lot of stuff and we're gonna have to account for like them actually going on payroll because they're taking some of this money in terms of a dividend opposed to payroll, which is where so it belongs. So their income is not in that 128. Now, two of the guys are, some of it is small, um, but this would be running at like a 30% margin. There's no way you run an HVAC company at 30. They might be at a 30% margin because they don't have stuff. Like they don't have a gal on the phone. They don't have a ton of trucks. Their truck cost is actually inside of their personal P&Ls. So it's like Bradford drives that truck for work and to take his wife out to dinner. Like that's his company car, that's everything. They're wrapped, but that's his truck. Same with the other two guys, that's their truck. I think these other guys is right along. So they only got three. So I think it's a cool business. Um, my favorite part about this is this guy here. This business does not work for me unless I got a guy who's going to do it because Brad knows nothing about HVAC and I don't intend on running an HVAC company today, tomorrow, or ever. Um, I'm never going to go on an appointment. I'm never going to go talk to people about their furnace, their air conditioner. I'm just, it's not me. But I like it. I like that it's a lead flow. I like that it's housing. I like that it's in our industry and I get it. I get it. I'm in construction. I understand this. But it currently makes $390,000 revenue. $128,000 NOI, let's assume that's all the way true. That's like $60-some-thousand a year. It doesn't really get me all that excited. And we have nowhere to go. We have not enough trucks. So day one, we got to hire like crazy. Where are we going to put them? What are they going to drive? Where are we going to put these people? Who's going to answer the phones? we got no CRM. we got nothing. Okay, cool. What else? Now we got a, this is a commercial. HVAC company over here. Okay, another deal like that. Revenue on this one is one, four, six, eight, zero, sixty-five. This guy's NOI, EBITDA, cash flow, whatever you want to call it. Three hundred and seven thousand one fifty-five per year plus included in the sale is $80,000 of FF&E. Fixtures, furniture, and equipment. So it's like an added. They are asking, they're selling 100% of the company. The guy's out, he wants to retire for $900,000. So this one, net income, and this one's true. All the way through and through, everything's in there, we got taxes and everything. So this is a sub, a little bit less than three, that's like a 2.9 multiple. So 2.9 times earnings is the purchase price. So if you wanna compare a multiple, go ahead and think of the shittiest stock you could possibly think of. Anyone have CNBC or any stock thing on their phone? Probably. Oh my God. Kevin, you got a CNBC or anything on your phone? Oh, Robin. Oh, Robin Hood. Yeah, Robin Hood? Okay, cool. Robin Hood should, go to, I don't know if Robin Hood has this. You got Robin Hood? What's the shittiest company we could think of right now? Worst run company you could possibly dream of. Tra publicly traded. I mean, I would argue it's Open Door. I mean, Open Door sucks at <laughs> what they do. They're horrible. Like, they're just losing money hand over fist. Go ahead and put Open Door in there. Let's Twilio. See. Twilio. Are they bad? Yeah, they're bad. Open Door Technologies. All right. Open get Door it. Technologies. Yep, that's it. They're like $3 a share. All right, so worst company I could possibly dream of. Um, Oh, they don't even have a PE ratio. They're so shitty. Um, here, go to uh, CNBC for me and try putting it in. Let's see if we can find out. Because this is a great thing to look at and compare it to. Their stock productions. Uh, it should be give you a PE ratio. Well, that's exactly it. 
but they're at 350. All right, so let's see. P E is. Oh, that one doesn't work because they're negative. Everything's negative. Uh, Twilio. Yeah. Okay. How do you even spell that? Go T W I L L I O. Twilio. Thing come up for me. I'll just do Zillow because they also suck, but they don't. They're not negative. Okay, so here we go. Zillow makes like negative, negative, negative money. Their return on. Um, Let's see. Gross margins are 20% revenue. Um, return on investments, negative 11%. But they're selling their company. Zillow's selling still forward PE, so 36 times earnings. So Zillow's at 36. So when I compare the multiple here, of three times earnings, 2.9, these companies make money. Zillow's negative, like negative millions and millions of dollars a quarter. They're 36 times forward earnings. What they project things hopefully happen, they're 36 times up, but they're negative, negative right now. So this is public. So you can buy a company on a public market for 36 times earnings that don't exist, or you can buy real companies for two and a half, three times earnings that actually exist. All right, so 100% of that one. These people have a 3,500 square foot warehouse. They lease, lease is up. Uh, it's a 30 year old company, great name, great brand. They have 11 vans, five trucks, one trailer, forklift. Um, CRM, systems, phone gal, the old, gonna retire. And this guy here will Two wants out. Guy's ready to retire. He will own or finance his business. He's good. He's got the bank who's interested. These people have a bank that will lend 100% and give you a $50,000 um, cash back credit. These people own or finance. And this is a bolt-on company. So this is a company that's in plumbing. So one of the things you talk to HVAC guys, you go out and fix the furnace. People always ask, do you guys do hot water tanks? But you need a plumber to do a hot water tank, not an HVAC guy. So plumbing is a great add-on to HVAC. So this is a 20-year-old commercial. Oh, big thing over here. These people's main customer is CVS. They have eight CVS accounts, and they're able to get every other CVS account in their region. They just don't have enough guys. Um, they are 65% commercial, um, I would put residential. The rest of their business, a bulk of their business is actually residential, but because it's such a big account, 65% of their business comes from here. They just don't have enough commercial guys. That's why this makes sense, commercial. This plumbing company over here is a 20 year old brand. Everyone knows this company. Um, revenue. One seven seven two oh fifty two. And operating income or profit three hundred and forty thousand dollars plus fifty thousand dollars of FF and E. They got nine employees, nine vehicles. Great phone gal. They 
got the system to make shit work. Owner will train and willing to stay on. Gotta pay them, but they'll stay on. Uh, they have a, oh, you get $3,000 in inventory here too, just PVC plumbing, pipes and shit. Okay. Uh, they pay $1,800 a month in rent. For 5,000 square feet in an opportunity zone. Which means a little bit rougher neighborhood. It doesn't have to be super rough. Like if you go to Triggers here on Grand Road, it's an opportunity zone. It's not a bad area, it's just an opportunity zone. So here you got a residential commercial company that's a couple dudes living, working out of their homes. Here you got a full service commercial group with an owner who's going to retire and a bunch of dudes who want to stay working who know the shit out of some commercial. So these companies I think work really well because this dude, Bradford, he wants to be a CEO of a company and run day to day. So cool, Brad, you keep your five guys. Hey, you just got nine more dudes. Um, how many people they have? I think they have nine dudes. Um, 11. 11, you got 11 full-time employees. Good news, Brad, you got 11 more guys working for you. Oh, and they all know commercial. So your job, Brad, is go call all these dudes from CVS, get the rest of the accounts, so let's get to work. Because this revenue number should double, like first quarter. This should stay, if anything, the same. But we now we can start hiring. Now we got enough vans. These guys can come back from work. And this one here is a plumbing company, which is a great bolt onto this. We can leave this guy in, who's willing to stay for a period of time. And he could do what's called an earnout. So instead of giving him 1.772, what, what the hell do he want for this company? Sorry, he wants 895,000 for the company. So instead of giving him 895 up front, or we can give him 895 up front, we have a total purchase price of what's all this together? We are paying. Are we paying for this? Paying 175. We're gonna pay nine hundred thousand, and we're gonna pay eight ninety five. One point nine million. I don't even know how much I'm paying for this shit, because that's not the most important thing here. Like the price is irrelevant to me. I, I don't care what the price is. I care about the multiples. And I care about the income streams. All right, so. 1.9 million should generate 340 plus NOI over here is 307. And then we get 60% of this number here. So what is that? That's 684,000 ish. 84. So $731,000 in NOI for $1.9 million. So that is like a 2.7% multiple of this. So this wasn't real exciting. 120, 60% of 128, all things combined. Now I get excited. I'm, we're getting close to a million dollars where it starts being worth some time. $731,000 of net operating income for these three companies. But my original problem is I had to solve for $150,000 tax deferring. Buying these three companies alone does not defer any of my taxes. It goes, cool, you use your gains to go buy three companies, great, pay me my taxes. But we take this company, acquire it. Now we're gonna merge it with this company here. He's now in charge of 11 guys, this retires. We go, great news, plumbing company. We now have an HVAC company that's gonna bolt onto your company and vice versa. HVAC guys, we have a plumbing arm that's going to be your sister company, and we're going to all move into the 5,000 square foot area. This might be on paper, it might be in practice. It depends on how it all lays out, but headquarters for whatever we're gonna call this, commercial residential plumbing.com, three companies combined, is going to be based out of this location because it's an opportunity zone. 
by moving this purchase into an opportunity zone, all these gains, the 150, plus anything up to $1.9 million in capital gains becomes deferred. It's an opportunity zone. All this money, $731,000, we're gonna pay tax on this like ordinary income. But now we have three companies doing this. I would argue that this seven point, just by combining these companies, I can assign a five times multiple to this because just by putting them together without even really operating, combining them, putting them in opportunity zone, that's probably actually a six time because it's in an opportunity zone. I just took a $1.9 million company and this is probably worth 3.6 tomorrow to somebody else because of this tax advantage, the systems, the people, the scale, and having this. So haven't deployed any money yet, but how do we pay for 1.9 million? This guy over here will own our financing. I need 20% to do an SPA loan. 10% of it has to come from me, right? So what is the hell is that equal? Um, $200,000 from me. $200,000 from the deal. So how are we going to do this? This is where I'm actually doing this in real time. This guy's gonna be the CEO over here. He was the CEO of a, what the hell did he value his company at? He values his company, let's just use 50% to get the number. 175, he values his company at 350,000. What we want to do is we want to value this guy's shares. 20%, 350, he has a $70,000 equity position. These two guys are just minorities. Owners. So that means they're worth $35,000 in equity. I want to make this guy the ruler, CEO of everything. Because this is a good dude. This is the guy you want to keep. So $70,000. This is equity share. These two companies here are worth $900,000 and $895,000. What is that equal? $900,000, Ooh, look at that. Almost freaking perfectly. He's going to donate, well, he's going to pledge his equity of this company towards my 200. And we're going to make him, instead of the 20% owner of this company, we're 70, we're going to make him a 10% owner of the 1.9. So Bradford, We're buying it at 1.97. He was worth 70. I just turned his $70,000 into $197,000 position. This is where this guy gets super jacked. Because now, instead of a 20% owner of a little tiny company, all he has to do is do what he's doing, just at a bigger scale. And now his position is worth 197, not assuming the multiple I just gave the company, which is position probably worth $360,000. So now this dude, has every drive in the world to see this thing through, to see this valuation at very minimum, if not that valuation. So now we got a 10% owner of the larger company. We pledged his equity. So now I gotta figure out $130,000, which will pull, we'll have this guy owner finance this 380. And you can do that. So this guy owner financed three hundred eighty thousand dollars here of the nine hundred. Six goes down to five hundred and twenty. Eight 
he gives us the 380. We got seven, seventy thousand dollars from this guy. So we have four hundred and fifty thousand dollars in capital to pledge to the bank for a note of one point five. So we can do bank financing. 1.5 million. This guy is going to own or finance 380. 180. We're going to lump in equity of $70,000. And that's how we're going to take our taxes, a 150 our issue. We're going to pledge none of our own capital. We're going to use all SBA financing, owner finance money, and equity to purchase this company here. Let's just throw off, what, 800, 700, what did we say, 700,000? $731,000 in money. So we're gonna do it. You guys have questions on that? <laughs> That's a nice <clears throat> SBA loan? Yes. What is that? Small Business Administration. So you go to any bank, like Huntington is the largest SBA lender in the area. So it's really easy to go get financing for a business. It's the easiest thing. You want to get a mortgage? Hard. Go get a car loan? Hard. Go get a loan for this? Super easy. Because they don't give a shit who you are. They go, ooh, NOI, NOI, NOI. Tax returns. Oh, you got the guys? Perfect. Love this deal. This deal's harder than this deal. This deal makes it real easy. They love this deal. Signing a personal guarantee on an SBA loan. So it's like buying a house. Like this thing goes under, they're coming after your shit, but you can protect that. Like, there's, there's ways to protect that. Um, but we just bought, if this is the way we structure it, and again, these aren't the prices we're really going to pay once we really dive into the nuts and bolts of it, but structure wise, I can go ahead and, and bring the 450 cash to close. Actually, I only need to bring half that, two and a quarter to close. 150 come from over there, 150 come another one. The rest could be owner finance really easily. This guy will actually owner finance this entire thing if you want him to, which we might. But this is exactly how you can take your taxes, defer them down the road. Oh, and when we sell this for a 3.6 or, or higher, because it's in the opportunity zone, this gain here from 1.97 to 3.6 is tax-free. You do not pay tax on this because the company was done inside an opportunity zone. So the revenue, every year you're gonna pay tax on it, but the revenue of it, you will never, you will not pay taxes when you go sell that company to somebody. You do a roll up, so what you do is you just keep chunking off little smaller companies, roll them into this thing and do what's called a roll up where you bring all of them under one umbrella and then you sell it to a private equity company for five, six, seven times earnings and you never pay taxes. Is there an age requirement that the business has to be in the opportunity zone to benefit? No, you could take, we could take our real estate company and move it to an opportunity zone and it would not pay taxes on the exit of it as long as it was moved into an opportunity zone. Yep. So it's a, uh, it's a pretty good deal. Yeah. So that's like, where people look and go, oh, this whole thing's unfair. And like, this is, this is what they did with the airlines. Like the corporate raiders of the 80s, like Sam Zell, like the coolest dude of all time. If you ever want to read about someone cool, Sam Zell's the ultimate gangster. Like that's my dude. Um, actually, that's why I started liquidating everything. Like Sam Zell, one of my fa his favorite quotes is, you guys ever heard of WeWork, the company? Mm -hmm. So WeWork, what they did is they went and they just leased all these giant like class A plus office buildings around the country. And they leased them all out and they said, oh, we're going to sublease these things out. Say they leased them for $8 a foot. They're going to sublease them out to $16 a foot to you, 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 and you. And they carved them up into little tiny offices. And they call them WeWork spaces. And the company got this massive multi-billion dollar, like one of the highest priced companies. Like they were out there with Apple and Google for a minute. Like how much they valued this company. And they went to Sam Zell on an interview and they go, Sam, what do you think about the valuation of WeWork? He goes, I've been watching this trying to be done since the 70s. I'm not sure what exactly is different here, but this is subleasing and this is worthless. He goes, call me when that turns to cash. And while well, the company went bankrupt, um, the dude almost like completely lost everything. And uh, 
that's what I remind like all these houses and apartments we bought is like remind me when it turns to cash so that's what we're doing we're actually just physically turning it to cash so why ride this roller coaster like this when we could just exit here buy some other stuff over here and then move it into some other stuff so let me while I'm on this stuff I'll go over some I don't know what, that's five more minutes on what you can do on the residential side that I'm also looking at in real time did you ever meet Sam? I did not, but I'd love to. I know people who know him. Dude, so great. That dude, he's awesome. Yeah. So freaking great. Super smart. He's like the the ultimate gangster. Like, he's the ultimate corporate writer. But that's exactly what he did with like massive companies and all the other recessions. Like, he's 100% cash now, like for the first time ever. He was the biggest owner of real estate before he sold out to uh, Blackstone. Blackrock? No, it's the black sound. Like the college apartment I lived in, University of Toledo? Yep, owned by Sam Stone. Do know everything. So, Kevin knows this. So, when I was buying, when I buy houses, there's a couple different ways I look at buying them and when I bring in partners. So, early on, and when the market was still in the early of going straight up, what I would do is I would say, Kevin, um, you put up the money for a house. And say the house is forty thousand dollars. I'll do the work. Put up seven thousand dollars. We'll sell the house. I won't take a commission, and we'll sell the house for sixty-five thousand dollars. Forty-seven, sixty-five. What is that? Eighteen thousand dollar profit. Yeah. Eighteen thousand dollar profit. And then we'll split it in half. And each person makes nine thousand dollars, right? Pretty sweet deal. In the real estate branding, you know, deals. Uncle Frank has forty thousand dollars. Cool. We're in business together. I'm gonna do the work, find a deal, do the acquisition, do the disposition, and we'll split the nine grand on the back door. Works out for everyone. Got money is never would have found the deal. Doesn't have to do anything. Where else are you gonna make that kind of return on your money, which is like twenty percent in three months? Annualized. That's an eighty percent return. Like that is called. If you told, sold that to someone, they would call you a Ponzi scheme, and that's not real. But when you do it on a deal basis like this, it kind of is real. So we did that for years. Then when I started thinking, hey, this thing's going to top out, I said, hey, everyone kind of thought I was a jerk at the time. And, oh, I'm just not doing the equity sharing thing anymore. And it wasn't because I'm like, ooh, I'm getting super greedy and I want to keep everything. I just knew this thing was going to top out. At some point, we were going to lose money. And I don't want to turn to anyone ever and say, hey, we just lost money on your investment. So I got 700 ways to not lose money on a real estate deal. So, but if I have Kevin a deal, Kevin might want his 40 grand back faster than I would need my 40 grand back. So if the market turns and we got the same $49,000 into the deal, because I put $9,000 into the deal, I could go ahead and rent this thing forever. Totally cool with it. I could own or finance this thing and make cash flows. Like I'm never going to take a loss on a piece of real estate. But I was going to have one of my equity partners do do that. So what I started doing is I started doing what's called private lending. So I went to our lenders and I said, hey, instead of going equity because we might very well lose and we might not make 10% on this deal, we might not make any money, which actually did happen on one deal. We think we made 7% total. Um, so three and a half percent shared super awesome money like that was like I should have just listen to stupid house but we caught the top of the market and caught the starts catching the backside so we started borrowing money at ten percent so ten percent a year on this is four thousand dollars four thousand dollars a year in interest interest only payments so this is young guys like this is what you want to start thinking about gals, everyone, this is, this is it. Um, so 40,000 and 10% interest, interest only. This is what we frame to our investors. And we've got a ton of stuff like this. So at the time, you couldn't really get a ton of people because the stock market was going straight up. Like, oh, I'm making 13, 14% of my equity. Why would I give my money out at 10%? I go, oh, because when the stock market goes negative, you're going to be glad you're fixed 10%. And while we're down 22% of the stock market this year. So the guys who are invested at 10%, they're super jacked because they're not negative 22. 
So now we pay this every month. So what does that equal? About $360 a month in interest payments. So for the $40,000 house, still put the nine grand in, still needed it. I'm at 10% interest on this thing. $360 a month for an average of, these things rent for about $750 to $800 a month. Okay, gotta pay taxes and insurance. Let's just say on a $40,000 house, let's just say everything all together is $175. Okay. So 360 plus 175. 525 bucks. It's rented for 750. $225 of free cash flow. Okay. Go find a deal. Hey, Uncle Frank, yeah, want to get real estate, pay 10% fixed, 10% interest, going to run it out, going to be $225 a month. This is like, uh, Doug, when we talk about buying a uh, duplex, you do this too. Mm -hmm. If you can't find someone to own or finance at 0% interest, you can borrow hard money and it works just the same. It's, it's all fine. Um, so we get $225 a month on each one of these things. Then after six months, say, Kevin or whoever's lending the money says, oh, said this is the maximum of 12 months. I'm out, kind of want my money back. We always write our deals for 12 months. Cool, I go to the bank and I say, bank, I bought this house for 40 grand. I know that house for 40 grand is really worth like 60, 70, $80,000 when I put this stuff in. So I go to the bank, I say, cool, I'm refinancing this thing after, let's just say it's been a year. And we all agree it's worth $80,000. So you gotta keep 20% in the deal for the bank to wanna do it. 25% actually in a lot of banks today. So they'll write a loan for $60,000. And today, 6.25%. This is a real life example on about $900,000 when we just refinance out. So $60,000, I owe him his $40,000 back. Back to the investor. It was interest only. So my payments, none of that went to principal. It was all interest. So I'm paying the principal back. I still got my $9,000 sunk cost. I'm going to pay myself back to nine for the rehab costs. Okay. And that's $11,000. Cash out refi. So uh, without doing the math on my calculator because I'm recording, I would say this payment, because I brought my interest payment down to 625 by rate of raise the principal up, I bet this payment is 600 bucks. So I bet it went up $75. Because it's low. Like it doesn't really move a whole lot when you got talking about that kind of money. So now we just moved up to 75 bucks, 600 dollars a month. This is a 20 year AM on a commercial paper. It's still running for the 750. So now I moved my cash flow down to $150 a month. Free cash flow. Raise, but raise the rent. You can raise the rent. It's been a year. You can definitely do that. But they gave me $11,000 cash. So now I got $11,000 walk around money. $150 a month forever. Got the depreciation. That's gonna, for 20 years, it'll pay itself off. These people will pay for it because they're already paying for it. They gave me 11 grand and I put up $9,000 in rehab. So I got all my money back plus 11 grand. And you gonna buy another one. And you have an asset. Yeah, and you got the asset. You buy another one, yeah, you buy 50 more. You just keep doing it at scale. So now, what am I doing? So I, the equity deal I loved, love this deal. 10% interest starts getting kind of high. So now what is my, the market changes, so I change. So I like my friends. I like the people invest with us. So it's really cool to see people, no fun getting rich by yourself. So 
and not bring your friends along with you. So here's the kind of deal I'm structuring today because I think there is equity. So I'm looking at a deal that Noah's bringing us. It's four properties. They're asking 125,000. We offered 90,000. Total or per property? No, total. Currently rented for a total rent of 1550 a month. That's all rental combined. They're all actually going up to $600 a month. So they're actually going to $2,400 a month in rent. So here's the deal. I am, we're selling another building. We want to, does anyone have this boring? No, no. All right, cool. Um, so here's exactly what we're doing. We bought a building over here. $490,000 apartment building. This is real life. Glenmont Avenue, Logan. You're well aware of this. We rented this thing out for 12 months at $7,800 a month. $490,000 purchase price. I brought my friends into the deal and said, hey, we're going to go 50-50 on this deal because that's what we were doing on the first iteration of equity. But instead of you bringing 50%, Brandon, you're the hard money guy, or my investor, my buddy. Um, instead of doing that, why don't you just bring 20% for the down payment and we'll use my bank to finance the rest. So the way that worked was, we'll just use round numbers and say they had to bring $100,000 for the down payment, which they're happy to do. They're like, shit, I was planning on bringing 250, so I'm gonna bring 100 for the down payment. Now we have, let's just say I'm the $500,000 purchase, keep things easy. Um, I still have $200,000, because I own a half, half this building. I just didn't bring the down payment, they did. So $200,000 is me, and I bought this with bank financing at 3.25%, which obviously we booked this when things were much cheaper, um, on a 20 year AM. Now they, we only have, let's see, three, no, I got 250. I'm 238 now. And now they have 200, no, 150. 400, I got 250, they got 150,000 because they brought $100,000. Okay, so now they're $100,000. So we go into the bank together. We're on the same loan, their LLC, my LLC. We both qualify for a loan for $400,000, because we're going to say this is five hundred. dollars just keep it easy. $500,000. $100,000 down payment. We get a loan for $400,000, but I'm still 50-50 partner, but they put down the money. So their bank, they're on the hook for one fifty dollars on an operating agreement. I'm on the hook for two fifty. dollars So when the payments come in and we split them 50-50, that is what, $37,000, $30,000? $3,900 each come in. My payment, I believe, is something like $2,200 a month to the bank. And their payment something like $1,400 to the bank. So our total all-in payment is $36. I'm responsible for my $39 for $2,200. They're responsible for $1,400. Of the $7,800, somebody has to manage it, right? So someone had to manage all of these tenants. So we can go to a property manager and they're gonna scalp us 10% plus every rehab fee. What I did is I said, hey, instead of paying 10, I charge eight and we manage it in house. So the first 8% comes to me. 8% property management comes to us because we manage it, shit goes wrong, we take the phone calls, we go do everything. $20, $3,900. So every month on top of that, I'm getting $1,700 a month in free cash flow. They make more, they make what, 2,500? So we did that for 13 months, just like that. Take the first eight, $1,700 a month. Again, I put zero in of my own money, it needs no work, zero. We raise rents, they're actually higher than that now. Today, flash forward, we're selling the property. $850,000 is what we're under contract to sell it for. Okay? So that's a realized gain of $350,000. Divide by two. 
175k each. They get their down payment back, so they have now $275,000 plus our principal pay down, which is probably another 25 grand. So we'll probably each all walk with about $185,000 in cash that we made in one year from this deal, buying an apartment, raising rents a little bit, selling to someone else for 850 because we bought it off market, bought it below market value. So we take the 175 and they're like, what the hell am I gonna do with all this money? I wanted to keep that place forever, but I totally get you wanting to sell it. I go, cool, 175, bring it back, plus the 100, plus the principal pay down. So they're gonna bring two, call it 300K. They got 300K, they need to deploy like tomorrow, as soon as this thing sells, because they don't wanna pay taxes. All four of these properties are in an opportunity zone. So I still got my tax issue over with my money. I'll just float it over here into this company bury it in my opportunity zone over there and use my own capital instead of doing it all owner finance or bank financing. I just got to bury it somewhere. This 175 doesn't need to be physically brought into this deal because I bought, what was it? $1.9 million in business. This can also go into the opportunity zone. It's just on paper. So I can defer these taxes as well because I bought $1.9 million worth of business in an opportunity zone over here. So $300,000. So they're going to come over here. And for, oh, we'll agree that we're gonna buy this place for 100,000. I think that's probably reasonable where we're gonna buy it at. They'll bring the 100,000, and here's what's gonna happen. $2,400 a month is gonna come in. And you would say, how would you split this deal up where it's fair, where I bring them into a deal? What do you think would be a fair deal for everyone? On rent? So here's what I'm thinking. So I like that deal, but what if they stop paying? Like that sucks, right? 50, 50 of nothing. And you put up all the money and I'm just making all that free cash flow. Here's what I'm thinking. This isn't an official deal yet. This is just what I'm thinking out loud. I'm gonna do what's called an 8% pref. So what that means is the first 8% of gains every month will probably pay out quarterly because you have expenses, you have taxes, insurance to come into this. The first 8% goes to the investor. So if we only make 8% on an annualized basis that month, so this should make this $2,400 a month is 24, 29,000. That's a 29% cap rate, not including costs. So let's call it a 20% cap rate. We should have 12% left over on good months. That's not always going to happen. So we'll pay an 8% pref, then I'll get the next, oh, I don't know. Let's just say 8% or we'll just say I get the rest. Let's we'll say I get the rest. Cause it'll be good months and bad months and I'm gonna do all the management, but I'm a manager for free. So I get whatever is left. Some months will be good, some months I'll be negative, some months I won't get paid. And then these I've just comped out, they're probably worth $220,000 on the market. When we decide to sell them, I'm gonna give them a 50% equity share. So when we go sell this, say we sold it in two weeks and we made $120,000, we each get 60. What are they gonna do? Probably pretty fair? Because I think we have another ride now on the equity trade. If we buy it cheap, I think on the other side of this, when the Fed starts lowering again, we're gonna ratchet right back up. I think it's gonna be quick, sharp, and then right back up again in prices and activity because they're gonna to have to cut interest rates. So I feel totally cool on deals that are 20 caps or 2% a month. So 100,000, if I get two grand a month, I'm totally cool with that because it's 2% of the purchase price per month. I think you could ride this thing out and it doesn't matter what the market does. I think that's how you do it. But it's also an opportunity zone, which means this money here from them to come over here, they're gonna defer their taxes. Cool, that money's deferred, the whatever the hell we made, $175,000. We sold this, made 60, this, these aren't taxed. These are an opportunity zone profits. So that money's tax free. However, they still got 175, they'll worry about again, they're gonna roll that into something else. So what we're probably gonna do in real time is we'll just buy a bigger building like Youngstown. Let's go buy, you get enough of these things, you go, ugh. We got all this money, we got to bury to not pay taxes. To defer them, you just go buy a five, six million dollar building, you roll a couple people in, everyone defers their taxes, use bank financing to do it, and then you get all the equity and all the cash flow. And all this was 
started with zero. Like this deal, I came with zero. This deal over here, I started with zero. It was just other people's money that did it. Or that was a 15% hard money that did it. And when you value it at the end, I don't know, what's it worth? 3.9, 4 million bucks, 12 months from zero. That's a, that's a couple bucks. But there's no reason everyone can't do that. Like it's literally, it's financial magic. Magician. Just numbers, <laughs> the right? Is, the key is finding the deals. Key is finding the deals. Yep. The Either got time or money. <laughs>